Bonjour à tous, bienvenue dans cet auditorium pour cette conférence. Good morning to all and welcome to this Louvre uh, conference which is on the archaeology, very innovative conference. We are very honored to have with us uh, traveling in the uh, antique kingdoms of Alula through the uh, coastal of Arabia, which doesn't need to be introduced. And you can still go and admire in the permanent exhibition of uh, the Louvre. Uh, thank you to the uh, Saudi Arabian uh, government with a uh, great partnership that we continue with great honor. And this conference will present the site of Dedan. And we can thank the uh, auditorium teams to uh, have done this with the scientists who are going to talk to you this afternoon. And we will also look at the uh, Que vous allez, uh, mieux connaître colossal of uh, stone, which has already some history with the Louvre, since it was restored here in the palace of the Louvre to be presented for the first time since it was discovered at the Road of Arabia in 2010, so a little more than 10 years ago. So back here to the Louvre to present this statue. And uh, this will also be an incredible idea to speak about the projects that take place in Alula and particularly the excavation on the Dan by the King Saud University since and since 2019 with a Franco-Saudi team, the Dadan archaeological project for the development of Alula and the Royal Commission of Alula which has made many findings, including in sanctuaries. This is what it's all about, because this is where the statue is. And we will hear two speakers, this exceptional conference. And it was supported by the teams of the auditorium here. And also a particular acknowledgement to Marianne Coty from the Department of Oriental Antiquities, who uh, accompanied for the past 12 years up. Saudi partners with this uh, project, a conference which will start right now. We are welcoming here Abdulhaman Al Suhaibini, who is the, the University of uh, the uh, King Road of uh, so speaking of specialist of uh, North Arabia. Uh, après avoir research, and he has uh, also presented a paper on the architecture of Dadan here in France. You will see that he speaks a wonderful French. And he works on the site of Dadan since 2006. He published a large number of papers on this subject, and since 2019 is co-directing the Dadan Franco-Saudi uh, project with uh, Jérôme Romer, the second speaker today, who is in charge of research at the CNRS at UMR 8167 on Middle East and Mediterranean. And he has published a number of uh, documents and started since 2008 research on North Saudi in uh, a Valley, in Agra, and then in Taj with the Franco-Saudi mission. And since 2019, this archaeological program dedicated to Dadan, an incredible project on uh, the uh, Bronze and Iron Age. We would like to thank you once once again for this conference. Thank you. Bonjour à toutes et à tous. Good afternoon, everyone. Before I give uh, the floor to Abdulrahman Azoulaye and myself, I would like to uh, thank the Louvre for inviting us to present this lecture, in particular Ariane Thomas, Marianne Coty of the Department of Oriental Antiquities, as well as Valentine Gay 
who worked a lot to the prepare this conference. So today we're going to present a lecture on the colossal statue from the Dan side that is currently on display in the Louvre. Two parts here, first presentation of the Dadan site and the works that are currently being carried out by the Franco-Saudi mission that we are leading, and then a presentation of the statue on display at the Louvre, supported by footage filmed by the Louvre teams. Let's begin with the site. The site of Dadan is located in the Alula Valley, in the mountainous region of Hijaz, at the northwest of present Saudi Arabia. This valley forms a long north to south corridor, bordered by sandstone mountains to the east and a basalt plateau to the west. There are several west wadis drained into it, so that it is at the center of a large catchment area of 8,000 kilometers, square kilometers. The presence of this water resource has, of course, played a determining role in the human occupation of the valley. It is reflected today in the presence at the bottom of the valley of a large palm grove that was already replanted in the previous century, but was known to have flourished already in antiquity. The site of Dadan is located on the eastern edge of the valley on an alluvial cone overlooking the palm grove and at the foot of an impressive 70 to 200 meter high red sandstone cliff. It forms a large oval tail of 600 meters north south and 250 meters east west, about nine hectares. This tail is covered with a pile of stone and punctuation with craters which correspond not only to looting but also above all the recovery of building materials indeed after it was abandoned the site was used as a quarry notably for the construction of the old city of Ul Al Ula but also for the Hijaz railway the railway built by the Ottoman Empire at the beginning of the 20th century between Damascus and Medina which runs along the western edge of the site. La falaise qui domine the le cliff that dominates the landscape is an integral part of the site. Indeed, at first glance, it can be seen that it has been intensively reworked. Its space is cut into a succession of flat, perpendicular rock faces, when approached, reveal the numerous tool marks. It's a huge open-air quarry, extending over a length of 1.5 kilometers. However, the cliff also contains numerous rectangular cavities corresponding to ancient tombs, localized or true chamber tombs. They are accompanied by inscriptions and sometimes reliefs. This is the case of the lion tombs that you just saw on screen. They are surmounted by two lion guardians for a very ancient syro hittite tradition. The cliff is therefore both the quarry and the necropolis of Dadan. In view of these impressive remains, the site did not fail to attract the attention of the first European explorers of northwestern Arabia. Spotted by the Englishman Doughty in 1878, then by the French Huber and the German Uting, who made the first copies of his inscriptions. However, the first in-depth exploration of the site is to be credited to the French domain Dominicans from the uh, Biblical School of Jerusalem, Antonin Jausen and Raphael Savignac, who carried out two major archaeological missions in Arabia in 1909 and 1910. They gave us a description of the remains of the site and copies of hundreds of inscriptions, all illustrated by remarkably precise drawings and, for the first time, by photographs. You can see them here on screen. During the 20th century, several foreign missions passed through Al Ula. They were more interested in the rock inscriptions than the archaeological remains. Only at the beginning of the 21st century, in 2004, archaeological excavations were undertaken for the first time at the Dadan site. They were carried out by the Department of Archaeology, or King Saud University in Riyadh. They lasted for 16 seasons until 2019, focusing on the northwest of the site, the large Dadan Sanctuary. 
2019, to give a new impulse to the archaeological exploration of the site, the Royal Commission for Alula and the French Agency for the Development of Alula have encouraged the creation of a new archaeological mission, the Dadan Archaeological Project, entrusted to the CNRS, and I co-direct this with my colleague Abdul Rahman. We have here a large-scale archaeological excavation, pedestrian surveys, and specialized studies with a view to global and diachronic understanding of the Dedan site. It also includes a component of training, cultural mediations with school children at the Alula region. And there's also an aspect of uh, school mediation for uh, all the schools in the Alula region. Thanks to this work in Dadan and also archaeological missions carried out in the northwest Arabia since the mid-2000s, in particular the Franco-Saudi mission of Mada in Saleh and the German-Saudi mission of Taima, we can now retrace the major stages of the history of the site in its regional context. Judging from ceramic finds, carbon footing datings by the Dadan archaeological project, the first the first occupation of the site dates back to the second half of the third millennium, the early Bronze Age in Levantine chronology. In addition, German colleagues were able to identify serial remains from a peripheral site of Danal. Tel Sac, dated to the late third millennium, suggesting some degree of agricultural development in the valley. These dates are consistent with what can be observed in North Arabia. In the third millennium, there were large walled oasis settlements with irrigation systems, notably in Taima and Kuraya. This phenomenon echoes the great wave of urbanization that took place in the Levant at the same time. But we have no idea at present of the nature and organization of the Dadan site at that period. The occupation of Dadan continues in the second millennium before uh, Christ. Again, this occupation horizon is confirmed by carbon-14 dating and ceramic finds. The main marker of this period is a painted ware and also uh, Another painting in the Kuraya painted ware, which is probably produced mainly at the nearby site of Al Kuwaria, characterized by a mixture of geometric and animal motifs. Usually painted in red and black on a light uh, background. This wear is very similar to the two color productions known for the same period in the Levant, confirming the existence of strong cultural interactions between northwest Arabia and the Levant at that period. For the first time, we have traces of buildings from this period in Dadan. The excavations of the Franco Saudi mission uncovered in the sector of Great Sanctuary of Dadan, several buildings leveled during the construction of the sanctuary. The construction can be dated to the middle of the second millennium BC. These buildings are made of a beautiful, well-cut blockwork. Their function is still uncertain, but they testify to the existence of monumental architecture on the site. On a regional scale, at the uh, valley scale, excavations carried out by a Franco-Saudi mission on a small peripheral site located one kilometer northeast of Denman, Tal al for example, revealed occupations from the end of the second millennium, dated, more precisely, the 13th and 11th century BC. These discoveries confirm that human occupation were not limited to the site of Dedan, but they extended into the valley. Above all, the layers from this period have revealed for the first time evidence of a local day of palm culture. It seems that a real oasis agriculture was in place from this period, with a canopy of date palms covering crops of fruit trees and cereals. 
ce que mettent en lumière ces découvertes. What these discoveries highlight is that the development of the Dan and the oases of Northwest Arabia is not exclusively linked, as is often believed, to the great caravan trade that developed in the first millennium BC, the incense route. The peak of the first millennium is in fact the culmination of a long process of oasis development that began as early as the third millennium BC or maybe even earlier. In any case, it seems undeniable that the domestication of dromedary at the beginning of the use of as a pack animal, which we now place around 1000 BC, gave a new impetus to the development of the oasis northwestern Arabia in general and Adan in particular. From an archaeological point of view, most of the remains found in Dedan date from the first millennium. So Dedan is a very significant milestone in this route from Egypt and uh, South Arabia. So as I was saying, the remains found in the Dedan uh, date from the first millennium, but we'll come back to that later. For the time being, I will insist on another important phenomenon, namely namely the appearance of written sources concerning Dedan. Dedan appears on the one hand in external sources. The site is first mentioned several times in the Bible, within reductional layers, mostly dating from the 7th to the 6th century BC. In the Genesis and the Chronicles, Dedan is mentioned as the brother of Sheba great trading kingdom of southern Arabia, whose queen visited Solomon. In Isaiah, in the oracle against Arabia, mention is made of the caravans of Dedan. Dedan is also mentioned in the book of Jeremiah, but in the book of Ezekiel, we have most information about him in his oracle against Tyre. According to Ezekiel, Dedan was one of the trading partners of the Phoenician city of Tyre and was renowned for its horse saddle cloth, which it exported. There were um, spices and other things in place. Dedan thus appears at this time as a caravan station of primary importance on the northern section of the incense route. In the middle of the 6th century BC, Dedan also appears in Mesopotamian sources on the occasion of the Babylonian king Nabonim campaign in the northwestern Arabia. In 553 BC, Nabonidus undertook to annex northwestern Arabia and establish his court in the oasis of Taima, 150 kilometers northeast of Dedan. He conquered five large oases in the northwestern Arabia including Dedan. Here on the screen you can see a relief left by Nabodid near El Haid. You see the king with a long robe and uh, a crown and is sort of uh, uh, making a sign. You have the uh, sign of the Shamash god and the of Ishtar. Nabonid mentions a king of Danana. We don't know what happened to that king, but he was probably overthrown and killed, like his colleague from Taima. This text suggests that there were a fragmented political landscape in the northwestern Arabia at the time with several oasis kingdoms, including a kingdom of Dadan. Interestingly, the, existing, uh, the existence of this oasis kingdom can now be corroborated by sources from within the oasis. Indeed, the first millennium saw the appearance of writing in a large part of Arabian Peninsula, and in particular North Arabia, where scripts and languages described as ancient North Arabian appeared. In Dedan, a local language and script appeared, both of which are referred to as Dedanitic and are illustrated by thousands of inscriptions. You can see one here. Although it remains very difficult to date these inscriptions precisely, it seems likely that this script appeared in the first half of the first millennium BC. Several of these inscriptions mention kings of Dedan, as the two you can see here probably uh, related to a commercial rivalry between those two oases controlling competing branches of the incense route. 
Inscriptions from Taima show that there was a conflict between this one and uh, Dadan, due probably to uh, this competition. Selon toute vraisemblance, le royaume de Dadan. In all likelihood, the Osis kingdom of Dadan did not survive the Nabodid campaign. However, the king left Arabia after 10 years in 543 BC. And Babylonian rule over the northwestern Arabia probably ended with this withdrawal, or at the latest, with the end of the Neo Babylonian Empire at the hands of the Persians in 539 BC. After the Neo-Babylonian withdrawal, the political situation in North Arabia is rather confusing. In the course of the second half of the first millennium, however, it seems that Dadan fell under the control of the kingdom of Lichian. Many Dadanite inscriptions are indeed dated not by the kings of Dadan, but the kings of Lichian. This name, Lichian, is not unknown to us. It appears in approximate transcriptions in Pliny the Elder, but also in early Islamic sources where it designates a tribe of um, East Arabia. Uh, Western Arabia. This tribe of Lihian dominated not only Dadan, but also the neighboring oasis of Taima, 150 kilometers to the northeast. Indeed, several inscriptions dated by Lihian kings have been found there. The chronology of this kingdom of Lihian is debated. We know at least eight kings of Lihian, and the cumulative sum of all their reigns would amount to 143 years, which is a minimum for the duration of this dynasty. These inscriptions never refer to an external event that is well dated, so it's difficult to date them precisely, although we made some excavations, as you will see later, allowing new hypotheses to be put forward. In any case, in the second half of the first millennium BC, under the Lichian dynasty, Dadan retained a prominent commercial role. In addition to local inscriptions in Dadanite, a large number of inscriptions in South Arabian, the language and script of the ancient cities of Yemen, can be found in the oasis. These inscriptions tell us the existence in Dadan of trading posts of South Arabian merchants from the kingdom of Mayin, the Minian kingdom. The Minian kingdom was the main player in trade in the Arabian Peninsula in the second half of the first millennium BC. Texts from Yemen confirm the existence of numerous matrimonial links between the Mayin and Dadan families. We can find uh, Minian inscriptions, as you can see here on screen, between the two reliefs, saying that it belonged to a member of that community. The date of the end of the Lyrian kingdom is much debated. Several dates have been proposed between 3rd and 1st century BC without it being really possible to decide at the moment. In any case, in the last three centuries BC, another urban center was developed, located about 15 kilometers north of Dadan, called Hegra. However, several inscriptions seem to point to a gradual transfer of the regional politic and economic center from Dadan to Hegra. The main one is the fact that Hegra started to mint money, unlike Dadan. Indeed, from the end of the 3rd century, local currencies imitating the famous Athenian tetradragons with the owl appeared in Hegra. It is not known, however, how the transfer took place or at what rate. What seems certain in any case is that Tudan definitively lost its role as a regional political center when the Nabataeans annexed northwestern Arabia shortly before the turn of the area. Indeed, in the second half of the first century, the famous caravan kingdom of Petra in Jordan expanded southwards to the region of Al-Ula in order to establish its hold in the incense route. However, when they annexed the region, Nabataeans chose to settle in Hegra rather than Dadan. After their arrival, there is no mention of the kings of Lichian. The city of Dadan would survive for another two or three centuries, as we'll see. 
but is clearly appearing to be in decline. As you can see, the history of Dedan is beginning to be known in broader outline. But there are still many grey areas. So to fill those gaps with our new excavation program, the Dedan Archaeological Project was launched in 2019. After a first season in 2020, prematurely interrupted by the COVID crisis, two major exca excavation campaigns could be carried out in 2021 and 2022. To conclude this presentation, I'd like to give you a brief overview of the discoveries. The mission's field activities were focused on five major excavation areas spread across the site. You can see here on the map. The mission also includes a survey of both the cliffs of the site and the mountain that dominates it, the Jabal al Huraiba. This big zone, we have only half of it on this map. The first area of excavation concerns the large sanctuary of Dadan, located in the northwestern end of the site. This sanctuary is organized around a large monolithic basin, which was the only visible vestige or remained on the site before the excavation began. The identification of the area as a sanctuary is to the credit of two pioneers, Jausen and Savignac, who visited the site in the early 20th century. They also were able to find the remains of monumental statues and large walls, evoking a temenos. This area has already been extensively excavated by our predecessors from King Saud University, who have uncovered a huge quantity of remains over nearly 3,200 square meters. Around the basin, they revealed a large rectangular building with very thick walls interpreted as a temple. However, this is a complex area. It is heavily disturbed by ancient and modern looting. So neither the organization nor the chronology of the sanctuary could be clearly established by our predecessors. In the sanctuary, the uh, excavations by the Dedan Sanctuary Project uh, were carried out to identify the dating of this. Right. And the first achievement is the identification of a monumental phase prior to the construction of the temple and the setting up of the basin. Several rectangular buildings made of very fine masonry have been identified and radiocarbon dated to the middle of the, 12, the second century uh, millennium before Christ. The second achievement is the dating of the main buildings to, of the sanctuary, the temple, the basin, and the well. So according to the latest available radiocarbon dates, the temple and the pool appear to have been built in the first half of the first millennium, most probably during the Dedan Kingdom. The, what is unknown is the function of this temple. We don't know if this is real really a temple or rather a monumental platform for cult activities. The well came later, at least in its uh, current status, the 6th or 5th century BC, which is confirmed by a monumental inscription attributing its construction to a king of Lichian. His name was lost. The third achievement is the identification of a late phase where the monumental adornment of the sanctuary was destroyed and replaced. This late phase, in which colossal statues were used as building material, can be dated to the second or the first century BC. Finally, the last achievement of our excavation is the clarification of the plan of this sanctuary, since its monumental door in the south could be identified and partially excavated. Further south, we opened a new large excavation area near the center of the ancient city, where, in spite of plunder holes or looting, uh, we could find architecture 
architectural remains. This sector was stripped of stones over an area of nearly 2,500 square meters, revealing its western part of the remains of several large buildings. The excavation of this western part finally revealed an entire urban quarter comprising seven buildings and adjacent streets. This urban district dates from the last major phase of the site, which can be dated to between the 2nd century and 3rd century uh, BC, or rather the 2nd century BC and the 3rd century AD. Monetary finds confirm that it was occupied during the middle of the 3rd century, well after the 1st century AD date previously given for the abandonment of this site. The building in this quarter was looted. Thickness of the wall suggests that they were originally for significant height. We can imagine several story constructions separated by relatively narrow streets. The excavations show that the buildings are founded on older walls, earlier walls, which can be dated to an earlier phase from the 5th to the 2nd century BC. This phase is characterized by numerous objects imported from Greek world, Attic ceramics, black glazed ceramics, statue uh, from uh, the uh, Egypt origin, uh, money, Ptolemaic money, and uh, also Greek statues and Egyptian statues. So we can think that there were significant uh, relations, uh, commercial relations. We can find also a house of the period that was uh, found under the form of a building with a central court. You can see the underfaces here. It is evoking Mediterranean models. At the interface between those two faces, important levels of destruction were identified. They contained, among other, fragments of monumental Minian inscriptions, which suggest the presence of a Minian temple in the 3rd, 2nd centuries BC in the vicinity. We hope to discover more of it. Finally, no less than eight deep test pits were excavated in Area C. They were up to five meters deep. Several of these test pits revealed a phase from the second half of the second millennium, characterized by mixed stones and mud brick constructions and by the presence of painted Kuraya ceramics. They reveal a continuous occupation sequence of more than 1,500 years, from the end of the second millennium BC to the third century AD. In spite of its complexity, this area contributes the reference stratigraphic sequence of the land site, which proves decisive for the understanding of its development over time and the dating of its material culture, in particular ceramics. A third excavation zone, a more modest dimension, concerns a small funerary sanctuary located outside the ancient city at the foot of the cliff. Here, a series of Dadanitic inscriptions suggested the presence of a large tomb associated with statues and cult objects. Our hopes were not disappointed because the excavation of this sector very quickly revealed a large demolition level containing 217 fragments of cult objects. Below this demolition level, further excavation revealed a small shrine with several dozens in situ objects. So they were left more than 2,000 years before. These objects are associated with rock niche, numerous statues, standing stones, incense burners. They are placed on rock niche and are arranged in two clearly distinct levels, suggesting two periods of use. During the last season, our team of uh, conservators began the conservation of these objects and in particular was able to reassemble 21 status statues of various sizes. This small sanctuary can be dated, thanks to first radiocarbon dates, between 350 and 50 BC. The accuracy of this chronology is crucial not only for the understanding of this sanctuary, but also for the political history of the region, as it will turn around the dating of two important Lichian kings mentioned in the inscriptions of the sanctuary.
après la mise à jour du, du sanctuaire, les... after uh, the revealing of the sanctuary, more uh, research and more excavations were carried out. We could find a statue of a small size. There was a, a thick layer of earth. However, uh, we could find also golden leaves were found in the quarry remains. The uh, excavation allowed to find uh, remains under two meters of uh, destructions, and it can reveal the technique of extraction used by the quarry quarrymen of the Dedan period. The last two excavation zones of our mission concern later periods. About one kilometer south of the main site, we found a small agglomeration dating from the late antiquity. The main building is currently being excavated and could be dated between 3rd and 6th century AD. The um, poorly known period of the Jahiliya, the last centuries before Islam. It is probably the fortified residence of a dominant family. Interestingly, ongoing archaeozoological analysis suggests that its inhabitants had a very different diet from that of earlier populations, which might suggest they belong to the Judaism or Christianity. This late antique sector thus offers perspectives no less new and no less exciting than the ancient city. Finally, our excavations also cover a medieval sector situated to the north of the ancient city. We resumed excavations started by the University of King Saud, and we are in the process of uncovering a large monumental building of unknown functions so occupied from the 8th to the 12th century AD. As you see, the history of Dadan is far from stopping at the turn of the era, and it, as is often believed. After the abandonment of the ancient city, human occupation actually shifted, first to the south during late antiquity, then to the north in the early Islamic period, and the huge building is associated to a settlement that you can see here in the background, and we're going to begin the excavations. To finish on the work of the mission, I would like to evoke briefly the result of the prospection that we carry out at the same time on the cliff of the site and the mountain which dominates it. If the prospecting on the cliffs locate hundreds of tombs, you can see them on screen, the mountain revealed large necropolis, imposing fortification walls, and two large sanctuaries associated with thousands of inscriptions and rock engraving. Alors pour ne pas être trop long, je n'évoquerai ici que l'un de ces sanctuaires. For the sake of time, I will evoke only one of these sanctuaries of mountain, located in the southeast part of the mountain, over the cliff at 100 meters high. This sanctuary appears as a long processional way, composed of long walls and stairs cut in the rock, connecting four peaks, one, two, three, and four, increasing si in size, leading to the highest point of the mountain range. And from there, you can see the whole valley and beyond. In view of the inscriptions that accompany it, this sanctuary must probably be associated to the Minian community of Dedan, and must therefore be probably dated between the 3rd and the 1st centuries BC. We started to open some drillings here in 2021, you can see some of them on the pictures here. There is much more to say about the results of these surveys. They revealed several thousands archaeological facts, but it would take us far beyond the time allotted to this conference. So I will therefore give the floor to my colleague Abdullah Rahman Al Suhaibani, who will explain the statue, hoping that you understand now the context of its discovery. Bonjour. Uh, 
Good morning. Thank you very much, Jerome. It's always very difficult to speak after Jerome, but I'll do my best. I wanted also to thank our friends and colleagues of the Louvre for this conference on Dedan and the statue. The statue exhibited in the Louvre comes from excavations carried out by the King Saud University in the Great Sanctuary of Dedan between 2003 and 18. In all likelihood, this sanctuary was dedicated to the great god of Dedan, Du Gabat, whose name probably means he of the forest, or rather, in this oasis context, he of the palm grove. The statue was found in a falling position with other statues of the same type in the vicinity of a large rectangular building identified as a temple, probably dated first half of the first millennium BC, remain in use until the second century BC. Despite differences in their style and quality of execution, all these statues present a similar iconography, of which the example exhibited in the Louvre is perfectly representative. The statue is of colossal dimension. It's 2.3 meters high and 80 centimeters wide, executed in a round in local red sandstone, probably from a large quarry that dominate the dead hand side. It represents a man in a frontal position, standing with his feet together. He is bare-chested and dressed in a loincloth that reaches above his knees. His arms are stretched along his body, and he wears a bracelet on the elbow of his left arm. At the back, the statue is held in place by a black sport that goes up to the base of the buttocks, leaving the figure's back visible. In its currently state, the statue is mutilated. Its head is gone, so are his hands and feet. The statue is distinguished by a concern for anatomical precision and modeling. The torso is divided in three parts, in the manner of monumental Egyptian statues from the end of the Said period, that is, at the beginning of the 6th century BC. This treatment of the torso can be found in particular in the famous statue of Naktoreb in prayer, dated to the beginning of the 6th century BC, and preserved in the Louvre Museum. The fleshy modeling of the torso can also evoke an influence of Greek statuary of the classical period, but this influence is more noticeable on other examples, where the musculature is exacerbated, like the one you can see on the right of the screen. The clavicles are subtly evoked. You can see the flesh tone is evoked by a red pigment, traces of which are preserved in places. What is striking about the figure anatomy, however, is the hypertrophied size of his arms, which probably evokes strength. We note that, as in Egyptian statuary, the sculptor has left reserves of material between the arms and the torso. The hands are lost, but other statues of the same type make it possible to restore closed fists without visible attribute. The back of the statue has also been carefully done. Although the anatomical treatment of the back remains basic, the sculpture has deliberately emphasized its power by means of a very marked vertebral groove. The same impression of strength can be seen in the curvature of the buttocks with certain details, such as the treatment of the elbow, show a more marked anatomical concern. Like the hands, the head of the figure is missing. Several heads of colossal dimension have been found in the temple area, but none of them match our statue. As you can see, they are very different in style, in design, and workmanship. All of them, however, wear a veil held in place at the forehead with a headband. This veil can be seen more clearly on another fragment where you can see they, they are held back, uh, forming a bead behind the neck. 
This detail can also be seen on a head found in the nearby oasis of Taima, which again has a different style, large eyes at an outline emphasized by lines in relief that are distantly reminiscent of Egyptian statuary. Given this diversity, no one knows for the moment what our statue's face looked like, but it is safe to assume that the hair were held back by a veil. The legs of this statue show the same concern for anatomical accuracy as the torso. The knees are rendered with a certain modeling by a double V-shaped groove. The calves are curved and the shins protrude. Again, feet are missing. But the straps of a sandal can be seen on the side. These sandals can be found on other statues in the series. Apart from these sandals, the only garment the figure is wearing is a loincloth covering the thighs. This loincloth is not Egyptian at all. Its lower edge is straight and it is held at the waist by a double belt, tied at the side, whose knot forms long spillovers. This loincloth was covered with a very white coating, laid out in several layers, which undoubtedly testifies to regular maintenance. While the shape of the loincloth is local, the contrast between the white of the cloth and the red of the flesh is strongly reminiscent of Egyptian male statuary. Apart from the loincloth, the only other item of adornment is a bracelet worn on the elbow of the left arm. This bracelet is twisted and set with a large gem. Although arm rings are common in Egyptian, Cypriot, and Assyrian statuary, no precise parallel has been found for this bracelet, especially that it is worn on the elbow and not the arm. Therefore, it seems to be a local type. In total, the statue is thus marked by a strong Egyptian influence, but includes indigenous iconographic traits, as much in the finery and the clothing as in the hypertrophy of the arms, symbol of power. It is therefore a local reinterpretation of Egyptian models. This Egyptian influence is not specific to Dedan and can be observed throughout northwestern Europe. Arabia. In the neighboring oasis of Taima, 125 kilometers northeast of Danan, contacts with Pharaonic Egypt are attested as early as the end of the second millennium, and divine representations dated to the 5th or 4th century BC testify to the fact that the Egyptian religious influence was not limited to Dadan. The representation of the great god of this oasis, Salm, for example, in the form of a bull carrying a solar disk between his horns, show a transposition of Egyptian religious iconography. From a chronological point of view, the main stylistic features of the statue evoke the neoclassical trend that prevailed in Egypt during the late period, i.e., from the middle of the 7th to the 4th century BC. To be more precise, the tree partition of the torso probably makes it possible to exclude a date earlier than the 6th century. However, a statue may have been made later than the 4th century as local captors were able to perpetuate an archaizing trend for a long time. Unfortunately, archaeology does not help us to refine the dating of this work. In the sanctuary, bases probably corresponding to colossal statues of this type were found by the at the beginning of the 20th century by Jaussen and Savignac, mentioned by Jérôme earlier on, the two Dominican friars. They all inscribed in the local language and script Dadanic and dated by kings of the Lichian dynasty. However, as we saw earlier, the chronology of this regional dynasty, which ruled Dadan and the neighboring oasis of Taima, is not yet well established. It's between the, last, the late 6th and the 1st centuries BC. 
Archaeology actually provides only a termus antiquem. During the season of 2021 of Dadan Archaeological Project, a colossal statue of the same time was found at a replacement in a late wall dated to the 2nd to 1st century BC. The dating range for this series of statues is therefore from the mid 6th to the 2nd century BC as they may have been produced over a fairly long period. What was the function of that statue and who did it represent? The fact that the whole series was found in a secondary context, in destruction levels or in replacement, does not help to answer these questions, but we have several clues. The first is the context in which the statues were found within a large sanctuary. They are therefore undoubtedly cult objects. Bases found provide evidence. An additional clue comes from the figure's attitude. It is shown in a passive attitude with its feet together and its arms at its side. If we interpret it according to the conventions of Egyptians' representation, this position evokes expectation. We are therefore probably dealing here with a figure waiting for an offering. But what is this figure? A fragment of a statue of the same type found as a replacement in the sanctuary bears the inscription King of Lichian. For this reason, these colossal statues are generally interpreted as representations of the kings of Lichian. However, the meaning of these inscriptions is not unambiguous. It may refer to the subject represented, as well as to the person who offered the statue. It is therefore unclear whether this is a royal representation or a divine representation offered by a king. This uncertainty is reinforced by other finds in the Dedan Oasis. In other sanctuaries of the Oasis, dozens of smaller versions of these statues are found. For example, in a small funerary sanctuary excavated by the Dedan Archaeological Project, a set of 21 statues of this type was found in context. Their iconography is similar to that of the colossal statues, from which they differ only in size and quality of execution. Some of these statues rested on offering tables with spouts, suggesting that they received liquid offerings. Yet, the inscriptions that accompany this small shrine suggest that at least one of these statues, probably the largest, represented a god, Ab Olaf. It is therefore quite possible that these stereotypical representations tend to represent divine figures, but they could also alternately represent divine or royal figures. Pending further epigraphic findings, the re question remains open. Finally, a few words must be said about the mutilations on this statue. As we saw, the statue lost his head, hands and feet. This most probably is a deliberate destruction, as tool impacts are visible on the, pack, the back of the statue's arms. On the other hand, all the statues of this type found in the sanctuary are mutilated in the same way as are the miniature versions found in the small funerary sanctuary that I just mentioned. If we refer again to the Egyptian parallel these mutilations are probably not insignificant. Decapitating the statue is clearly aimed at taking away its life. Removing its hand and feet is depriving it of its capacity, capacity for action and movement. It is therefore probably a symbolic destruction aimed at depriving the royal or divine image of its power. 
There is every indication that such mutilations were perpetrated as early as in antiquity. Indeed, as we saw a moment ago, several of these statues were replaced in late walls dating from the 2nd or 1st century BC. As for the smaller statues, statues found in the funerary sanctuary mentioned before, they were probably also destroy, destroyed in the same period. We are therefore dealing with an episode of systematic vandalism that affected all the Dadan sanctuaries shortly before the turn of the era. This episode of vandalism may have been linked to a political change since the last two centuries BC saw the decline of the Kingdom of Lichian, the passage of region under the control of Nabataean kings of Petra, who settled in uh, the nearby city of Higra. The new masters of the region may have wanted to get rid of the images of the predecessors and even the images of deities associated with the previous dynasty. It may be noted, in fact, that there is no further evidence of the god Dugabat after the Nabataean conquest. A bilingual Aramaic Dadanistic inscription found in the sanctuary testified to the existence of Dadan in Dadan of a cult to Dushara, the great Nabataean god, around the turn of the area. Oh, this statue constitutes an exceptional testimony to the great political and religious developments of northwestern Arabia in the second half of the first millennium BC. Thank you for your attention.